This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Ask the Expert. As always, I'm your host, Steph Storer. And on today's episode, we're doing something a little bit different. Rather than a specific, quote, character, for lack of a better word, today's theme is going to be inside the English home from 1400 to 1700 ish. And who better to discuss this topic than the brilliant historian Ian Mortimer? Thank you so much for joining us, Ian. Thank you very much for inviting me. This topic obviously spans across several hundred years. And that really illustrates for us what an expert you are, I think. So just to just off the cuff like this, to be able to answer questions about their home lives within all these different centuries is is such a privilege for us. Do you have oh sorry, go ahead. I mean, it, 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 it is, I have to admit, it's a much broader sort of uh, palette than most uh, um, academics work with. Uh, but I must admit, you you do learn a lot about the 15th century, for example, by being aware of what happened later in the 17th and 18th, and likewise, the roots of the changes that you discuss, so uh, uh, that one finds in these periods. So it actually is really... Uh, a, a very rewarding way of looking at history to to concentrate on one country and just look at the very long term. Do you have a favorite moment in English history that you're most comfortable with? I'm sure it's hard to pick, but what do you think? Uh, well, uh, my specialist subject is, uh, it sounds like a tiny detail, the, the supposed death of Edward II in 1327. But from my arguments with academics and basically the entire history profession uh, over the subsequent years about how we understand the past through that one event, you know, that, that I have to say is my special subject. And uh, it's, it's an ongoing debate with me at the moment uh, between me and the Royal Historical Society who uh, are, are in a very difficult position because they are trying to uphold the academics who want to say we can be sure that Edward II died in 1327. And on the other hand, I can prove that you can only maintain that by relying on circular arguments. So I've learned so much about the philosophy of history, uh, historical methodology, um, through maintaining that argument that that is my favourite or favourite subject, as it were. At, at the same time, it's one that causes me sort of uh, chills every time I hear the word over the second. When people ask me to which date or wh one point in time I would like to go back to, if I really could travel in time, in the spirit of the Time Traveller's Guides to Medieval Elizabethan Restoration and Regency Britain, um, I always say it's the first performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in Vienna uh, in 1825. Um, uh, actually, the first performance 1824 in Vienna. Um, that that moment, that piece of music that embraces the world and embraces all time, I just think is such a, a fantastic instant to have witnessed. Um, so yes, ironically, despite the fact I'm an English historian specialising in broad sweep of English history, the moment I would go back to isn't actually an English moment. It was, however, um, commissioned by the Philharmonic Society of London. So we've got a little bit of involvement in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. That's beautiful. What an interesting little point to to make, especially since we're sitting here talking about how we have all these centuries of your knowledge and, and your moment that you're picking is in a different country and in a different time. <laughs> all right. So let's see if we can start. Um, we've got a lot of questions to cover today and obviously a lot of years to cover as well. So we're going to try to lump things together by topic because I think that makes the most sense. And I think for the listeners, that might be the, the easiest way to go about this. Um, and again, we're going to be talking about inside the English home. So the way we can start, I think, talking about the uh, inside the English home is the actual structure of the English home. So let's talk about homes themselves. So the first thing that we that we'd like to cover is country versus city. And again, I, I understand that a city then did not necessarily look like what it looks like now, but what can you say the biggest differences are uh, between rural type homes and ones that were in um, more populated areas? Right. We're talking about uh, three centuries, 1400 to 1700, the most enormous changes, changes in architecture, changes in ways of living, but these affect 
all classes and not just city or country. So if you wanted to have a, a, a real contrast at the start of this period, well, if you're going to be looking at the, the, the royal palaces um, of circa 1400, uh, you are looking at very large stone structures. You are looking at Everything based around a great hall, everything based around people uh, uh, serving the Lord, serving the king. Very large households, royal households and noble households were normally, well, royal households in excess of 500 people serving the king. Uh, a noble household may well be in excess of 100, again, all around the great hall, but already with private rooms for the most important people. That medieval collective living had shifted into private living in the biggest houses. That's at the top level of society in 1400. As you come down, obviously, there's much less space. And when you get down to people living in, for example, my house, which was around in 1400, well, there, everything was geared around a hall. This, I should add, is a very small town. So you would consider it rural, but it was a small market town. Uh, everything geared around the hall, but the householder, his family, and probably two or three servants in the hall space, an inner room where he would have kept his precious objects, and then at the other end of the hall, uh, a service wing, which would, included a, would have included a buttery, um, a pantry, a buttery for everything wet, a pantry for everything dry, so bread in the pantry, linen in the pantry, uh, ale in the buttery, uh, wine if he could afford it in the buttery, and probably a separate kitchen on the other side of the yard. Separate kitchen because the risk of fire. So in 1400, there's this similarity between the, the, the top end of society and the bottom end of society, and they're all right, operating around a hall. And that would also have applied in 1400 in a normal townhouse for a, a trader, except there's not much space in a town, so you build up rather than along. So uh, a, a townhouse would have specifically have differed by being on built on at least two stories, if not three, sometimes four, and even in London, five stories by 1400. Uh, normally, you'd have a shop at the front, a hall in behind, extending several stories high, and then chambers uh, at the front are built above the shop. So you've got these three different models then. Now, if you come through to 1700, your townhouse is brick-fronted or stone-fronted, just as high similar you know, long burgage plot sort of uh, uh, arrangement. Your country house, uh, country yeoman's house, for example, is still that sort of same um, long shape spreading out across its garden. Um, but the royal palaces, of course, have changed beyond all recognition uh, by 1700. Um, the the well, if you th if you can picture the banqueting hall uh, uh, in Whitehall, then you'll have an idea of how opulent and how artistic, uh, architecturally refined royal living had had become. Um, yeah, I mean, you really want to sort of uh, think in terms of contrasting. Let's say, uh, well, Versailles is the great. Oh, it's French, I know, but that level of opulence, Versailles Palace sort of uh, style of living with um, what would you could call a sprawling, drafty castle. So um, there's, there's really quite a contrast over these, uh, these centuries. You had mentioned about um, everything kind of revolving around the one great hall. Yeah. Uh, but some of our listeners are wondering when, when things actually moved from having one kind of bigger room to several separate rooms. So when did that start to happen and what were inner walls made of at the time? Yeah, good question. The uh, It's a very, very long, slow shift how we move from a medieval way of living, which is basically everybody in one space. At the top end of society, there were always separate chambers for the, 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 the lord, the king, but normally everybody else shared the hall, the, 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 the communal space. And how do we get to the, the situation where everybody has their own separate rooms, as it were, which is much a much more modern way of living? It starts to happen after the Black Death in 1350. Well, 1348, 1349, Black Death came to England. After that, you find a rise of individualism, a rise of um, uh, desire for personal space, a rise in the expression of personality, and a greater interest in human beings as individuals as opposed to creatures created by God directly 
serving God's business. There's a much more um, uh, secular way of life, and that feeds in to separate living. Now, if you look at a castle like um, Bodium, which was built in 1380s, 1386, I believe, that has a great hall, but it has lots of chambers around it for individual sleeping arrangements and uh, living uh, accommodation. If you look at a castle that was a little bit before that, say 100 years before that, no, there are very few chambers. Everybody's still sharing the, 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 the great hall living space um, before the Black Death. So already by the time we're talking about 1400, that rise of independent living has already started. But of course, this is for the, the wealthy. And uh, down at the bottom end of society, houses are still very much open. Their internal partitions are normally of, in, in the case of my house, it was wood, plank and muntin screens, if you know what those are, which are wooden screens with planks between sort of blocks of wood. And these would have, um, well, the one here rises to about seven or eight feet. And above that, it was open. So your fire in the middle of the hall, which was in the middle of the hall, people slept around it, the smoke from that rose up and that sort of blackened all the roof on the underside in a, in a house like this. Um, in uh, more aristocratic um, residences, you'd have had uh, internal walls of stone. They had uh, masons building um, in internal stone walls as well as uh, external ones. But in um, other houses like this, uh, but further up the country, where plank and mountain screens were less of a tradition, they used wattle and daub inside. So if you imagine your sort of uh, beams going up from the ground and then wattle or sticks woven in between them, and then that all covered in lime plaster. That is your partition in an uh, internal wall in a house um, which doesn't have the same building traditions as we have here in the southwest of England. So a mixture of internal walls, but a greater breaking up of things. I One of my projects that I have and um, with my wife, we, we, we've been doing for a number of years and carry on doing for a number more years, is to look at all the old pubs in this country, all the old inns, all the old taverns. And it's interesting how a medieval tavern started to be broken up in the 16th and 17th century into separate rooms, smaller and smaller rooms, and so did the inns for greater, greater privacy. And nowadays, of course, we're taking out all those internal walls and making the places bigger again. So we've gone like full circle. We're almost coming round to our, our public houses and our hotels and inns wanting to have large communal spaces again, um, uh, a, bit, a bit like the Middle, middle Ages. Uh, so yes, you, you, you see a greater privatisation or um, greater desire for privacy by 1400, and that just increases more and more all the way through to the end of the 17th century. Um, and people found numerous ways of dividing up their properties to uh, provide this greater privacy. And now what about the floors? What about the flooring? What do you think you could expect for the floors to be made? Depends how wealthy you are. I mean, if you, uh, and depends which time. I think that's going to be the work. answer to every question, right? <laughs> question. We're talking about, I mean, I think that's one thing. I mean, if I could preface all these questions with this answer that society was so hierarchical. I mean, if if you wanted one thing that would make you feel completely alien in this period, it is how hierarchical society is. Uh, we have nothing like the equivalent today. Yes, we have hugely rich people. We have billionaires who are, have spending power beyond anything that people could have dreamt about in the past. But we don't have the sense of hierarchy, which in, it was involved in absolutely everything uh, in society. So that if you were a high status person in giving evidence in court, your evidence would automatically be preferred to somebody who was an eyewitness of events, but was lower status. So from, well, in, in church, for example, the high status people got better seats, etc. Um, whether you could command in the army was down to your birth, you know, and how wealthy you were. Everything was down to, to status. So that's the one thing we have to remember with all these uh, uh, questions we're, we're answering here. Floors. In the um, uh, Middle Ages, uh, obviously for upstairs, you're, you're looking at oak or elm boards everywhere. That, that's pretty much um, universal um, with uh, 
rushes on the floors uh, in some cases, but rush matting increasingly in the 16th century, rush matting rather than rushes on upper floors. Um, on ground floor, you may well have rushes too. In fact, uh, herbs and rushes was, was quite common in all status living, but most floors, even for the quite well off on the ground floor, were packed earth around 1400. So really hard packed earth. Sometimes they would um, pour uh, blood, cow's blood over it so that with the um, passage of feet, you would get a shiny hard surface. So it's not just packed earth, it could also have a, a, a blood flooring too. As time goes on, as the 16th century uh, uh, comes to greet us, uh, increasingly people want stone flooring uh, in emulation of the wealthy. So flagstones are increasingly um, used. By the 17th century, um, the wealthy are no longer happy with flagstones. They want marble flooring. And therefore, you've got this whole hierarchy of uh, flooring types in people's houses. So um, thinking of a manor house, which is about five miles away from here with a 17th century hall, they have a marble hall floor, um, black and white squares, uh, like a big chessboard. That was a very common thing in the 17th century. Around the rest of that house, it's uh, uh, flagstones or floorboards. Um, the part of my house that dates from that same period, um, well, it would have had a packed earth floor still, but some of the uh, area is floorboards. Um, and packed earth remained in use right the way down the centuries. Um, so quite a variety and you would really have felt the uh, different status of the householder when you walked into the premises and looked around you and felt what was under your feet. As you as you give us these descriptions and these kind of mental illustrations of what the houses and the walls or sorry the floors and the walls and everything look like I'm sitting here going I can picture it but I could never picture that being you know your home uh -huh. It's just, it's such a crazy thing to think about that, that that's how people actually lived. And it really does kind of speak to how you were mentioning the hierarchical um, issues that they had, because people literally had a blood floor beneath them at yeah. one point. Um, yes, I thought that was quite a distasteful thing, but apparently it works quite well. Um, to, 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 it ends up with a polished surface after a period of time, uh, a, a blood-soaked um, earth floor. And but even the process of yeah, figuring think, out that that works is strange. Yeah, yeah well, quite. I mean, yeah. Like, there are so many discoveries in the past. You think, now what on earth made them think of that? I was wondering... Well, exactly. I mean... Cheese. I mean, whoever invented cheese did the whole human race an awful lot of good because it's a source of protein you can keep all the way through the winter, whereas most people can't afford to have protein through winter. And yet, you know, how on earth do they think of that? You know, we're going to leave some milk on the side there until it's gone sort of strange. And then we're going to see. Yes. Yeah. And then we'll taste it. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Who want a volunteer, please? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. Um, and so now what about furniture? So we have kind of the layout and we, we, we can picture the structure of the, the house. And in my head, um, the, the lower classes, I'm picturing just, you know, a random stool here, maybe a table and that's it. Whereas obviously in the castles and the more wealthy people have, have more furniture. But what do you think that the house was filled with? as you move from the lower classes to the higher classes. Upper classes. I mean, again, this uh, changes so rapidly over the, these three centuries. And when we're talking about houses, also there's one other thing I think I ought to sort of uh, mention here when we're picturing these houses, that the outer walls, we mentioned the inner walls of partitions and plank and mountain screens and floors of various things. But outer walls, you've got to remember that um, I mean, pe people see a bare stone wall and think it looks medieval. People covered up bare stone in the Middle Ages. They didn't like bare stone being seen. So when you looked at a, a house, you would find it painted or covered in something or other. But the material they were making it from, I mean, around this part of the world, so southwest England, high on Dartmoor, a long way away from the nearest um, uh, roads where you could get uh, wheeled vehicles, they were still building at that stage with turf walls. And you find this in some parts of Northern England and in Scotland too, and in Ireland, uh, the turf wall lasted much longer than people realize. So a turf 
um, when you're making a turf wall, you have uh, turves which are cut with the roots, and they're normally about three foot by two. And the, the three foot section is the width of the wall. You, you lay them up and then you, you put your roof over the top of them. They're really draft proof. So it's a, a lot of sense in having these, these turf walls. So within the turf wall, you will then have a, a wattle and daub lining to your house. Um, so some people are still living in these primitive conditions at the start of this period. Within that framework, you can imagine that if you're living still in a turf walled house in 1400, your furniture is pretty basic. We do have inventories from the, the 14th and 15th centuries which indicate what labourers had in their houses, and they had very little furniture. They probably did not have a bed. They probably did not have a table as such. What they did have was a couple of trestles and a table board. Now, I'm thinking here of the sort of labourer who would be, he would have nothing but maybe a, an acre of garden, if that, and he would work for his living for um, either for a yeoman or for the lord of the manor. He might even be an unfree peasant still, in which case he wasn't allowed to leave the manor without his uh, lord's permission. Now, he's living in a one or two room dwelling, I imagine, with a packed earth floor, with turf walls, and his furniture is literally a trestle table, which he'll put away because there's not enough space in the, in the area for his family to have it up all the time. It will have benches, it won't have seats, there are no chairs that, uh, for, for the poor at that time. So benches, a trestle table, probably a working surface of some sort where they can um, knead dough for bread if they have the right to bake their own bread. Of course, the manorial lord might say you have to use uh, the man baker and uh, etc. Um, and for, for, for preparing food. And really, that's about it. Um, they slept on uh, straw mattresses around the fire and, and life at that level was uh, uh, pretty grim and uh, testing. Um, as you go up the society in 1400, if you can picture your lords, then you wouldn't have had as much furniture as you would have done 100 years later or 200 years later, especially in Elizabeth's reign. But you'd have had much more of it. You would have had the ombre showing your, your best pewterware and uh, silverware. Um, you'd have had a permanent table, probably, um, although it could still be a trestle table in a great hall. You'd have had long benches for all your staff members. You'd have had a chair for the, 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 the lord of the household. You'd have had um, various other sort of, we call them sideboards. I mean, it's not a modern sideboard, but it's literally a board on the side where you can actually prepare the next course to bring to the table. Um, in bedchambers, obviously, they had beds, they had many chests. Uh, mm. The chest as a, a fundamental unit of English furniture remained really popular right the way through to the end of the 17th century when chests of drawers took over. But the English chest you'd have found in every um, uh, household with more elaborate ones as you went up um, in, in society. And of course, at the top end of society, you'd have had the chapel with all that's furniture, all the furniture you get for that. So uh, the, the, the altar and the, the lectern and all the uh, paraphernalia of religious worship. Um, so more of it as you go up society in the, in the 15th century, but still nowhere near as much as you would have had in the, the 16th. Um, and by the 17th century, English houses were being furnished with more or less the same number of items of furniture as you would have in relatively modern times. So you would have had permanent tables, you would have had um, book presses or bookcases, uh, you would have had chests of drawers, you would have had um, all manner of pieces of furniture that uh, you would not have had in the Middle Ages. Uh, yeah, so quite quite a, a, a growth. And of course, as you went up society in the 17th century too, the more elaborate and the more exotic uh, furniture was. So the, the chinoiserie uh, cabinet was the, sort of the must-have item for the late 17th century, showing how uh, your wealth and also your taste in um, uh, having your eyes open to objects brought across from China and Japan. This brief interruption is brought to you by, well, me. Do you love Tudor's Dynasty? Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of amazing things that the everyday listener does not. Find out more by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty, and click Become a Patron for details.
All right, back to the show. You just mentioned the, the must-have items, which is a really helpful next segue because I was going to ask you about status symbols or pieces um, in people's homes that showed off their um, their status or their position. So you've kind of gone through some things like certain furniture, obviously yep. the type of flooring or what the walls were made of. But what other types of things can you think of that if you walked into a room and you said, oh, that, you know, this type of window or something is means that they've got money here. Well, what types I mean, of things like that were? The, the obvious one when you say window is glass. I mean, the, the, the sure. 50, 68, very, very few people had glass in their houses unless they were very wealthy. Um, I actually just laying aside the glass for the moment. Um, I have a, a benchmark for this because most of the time I'm looking at society from the bottom up rather than top down. I do write, write about monarchs, I do write about lords, and I find um, them very interesting because they normally kept good accounts, and therefore because I'm always coming at things from primary source material, not from secondary. Uh, I'm particularly heavy user of archives and, uh, uh, and domestic accounts. So from the, from the top end of society, yeah, there was lots of these things, and your, your chinoiserie of any sort, whether it be wallpaper at the end of the 17th century or or cabinets, or whatever. Um, my my benchmark, though, is because I'm looking at lower classes, is the silver spoon. And when you look through inventories, um, which are pretty common from about 1550 onwards, 1560 onwards, um, and we have a, several million of them for, for England over the period 1550 through to about 1750, um, you can really see how people try and demonstrate their um, uh, standing in the eyes of their fellow um, yeomen frequently, but uh, by what they have as their silverware. Uh, silverware is key, uh, and you can see that a wealthy yeoman, as soon as he can afford to do so, would invest in a set of six silver spoons, really, so he's able to demonstrate his standard of living on a, a new level. And of course, if you can demonstrate a higher standard of living, you're going to have a better chance of moving in wealthier circles and introducing your children to potentially better bridegrooms and brides and elevate your family. Um, silver is, uh, is key. I mean, a, a silver a spoon in the 17th century, uh, well, no, 16th century, probably would be two to three shillings at a time when uh, a manorial lord may well have a thousand pounds worth of um, uh, silver in his household. So two to three shillings doesn't sound that much, but when you think that the normal labourer is only earning fourpence a day, it is quite a, a heavy uh, outlay. So if you made a, a comparison based around labourer's wages, well, if you're thinking of a two shilling silver spoon being, what, six times labourer's daily wages, and if a labourer today is earning uh, 120 pounds, six times that, we're looking at a silver spoon being 720 quids worth. Now, silver's nowhere near that valuable today, but that's how prized that item was, and that's why it's such a demonstration of wealth. Um, there's a great uh, a book by William Harrison, uh, a description of England, which um, he put together in Elizabeth First Reign. And he writes in there that uh, in his parish in Essex, old men said that three things had fundamentally changed in the course of their lifetimes, which were for the better. Um, one of them was uh, getting rid of wooden bowls and wooden trenchers and wooden spoons and replacing them with pewter bowls and uh, Pewter, train, uh, pewter plates and silver spoons. Um, and the other two he mentions were going from central hearths where the smoke gets everywhere. And I've given lectures in old houses where they still have a central hearth and the smoke really does get everywhere. They're a nightmare to live in. And replacing that with a chimney. Chimneys are so much more civilised. That was the second great change he noted in, uh, in 1577, he wrote. And the third great change was... Um, not sleeping on straw mattresses on the floor, but sleeping on feather beds in a bedstead with a pillow. That was that was the key thing, a pillow. And that was the mark of progress in 1577. 
Meanwhile, we're all over here. Like I need 10 pillows. I need extra pillows for, <laughs> for decoration. And you just, you take so many of these things for granted, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I've got this book coming out, which I'm uh, just in the course of rewriting for publication. It'll come out next uh, April next year. So April, 2023, it's called Medieval Horizons, which basically shows how much medieval the medieval period contributed to our way of life how all the things we take for granted are actually products of the middle ages things like this the the the, the idea of comfort in your bedroom or or staying warm i mean there, there, there is another one um the idea of uh, equality i mean the the so many of the things we take for granted that people don't even realize were any different in the past are results of the middle ages so yes medieval horizons is is on the on the books for uh, about april next year uh, and it really argues if you take it at, um, at its most essential point that more changed in the years before 1600 than has happened since because we went from a, you know, a warlike society in which there were no privileges, there were no comforts, it was just a struggle to survive in the 11th century, uh, right the way through to a period which produced Shakespeare, refinement um, uh, uh, and comfort. So, yeah, we are everything we have in common with Shakespeare is a product of the Middle Ages, if you think in the, those terms. Um, and then you realise how really uh, the essential changes that civilised us are all before that time. It's so amazing that there's all these things that took so long and and now, you know, our biggest thing, we're like, have our iPhone when we didn't even realize that a <laughs> pillow was, was like the most basic thing that people didn't even have. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on now to the kitchens. Um, you started talking a little bit about the, you know, silverware and plates and things like that. But how do you think the kitchens changed from over the course of this time period that we're looking at? Well, the word kitchen would have really had significance only for the reasonably well off. I'm not just the aristocracy, the, the, the yeomanry had their separate kitchens too. The person who was in my house in the in 1400 probably had a, his kitchen is probably actually exactly where I'm sitting now, outside his back door across the other side of the yard from the well. Um, it would have been a separate building for him. Um, and that was pretty much true all the way up society, though big stone built houses like Dartington Hall, for example, an aristocratic residence from about 1390 that has built in. It's still separate, but it's built in as part of the main complex of the main hall. Um, the the kitchens, for those who had them, are dependent, obviously, according to wealth, because the servants in the kitchen were catering for bigger and bigger households. So a Dartington Hall um, uh, John Holland had a staff of about 100 people with him. So you have immense fireplaces. And when I say immense, I mean 14 feet wide fireplaces, uh, which were going most of the time to roast meat for the, the aristocratic uh, entourage and to cook all the sauces um, to go with uh, the, the various dishes served to the rest of the household. On a smaller scale, you'd have had the kitchen uh, in a for a house like this as being a single uh, large fireplace, possibly two, because you might have had a separate furnace fireplace for brewing ale for the household, depending on how many people you were creating the ale for. Um, but a, a, a main fireplace, um, here they would have had the right to bake their own bread, so they might, might well have built a bread oven, but the existing bread oven in this house is part of a kitchen that was put in in about 1600 when they brought they built a large chimney in what had been the, the service wing and they put a bread oven on the side of that and they basically brought the kitchen indoors as it were that was about 1600 but i have to add that at the bottom end of society in the middle ages you wouldn't have had a separate kitchen you'd have simply cooked over the fire in your hall or in the lowest ends of society if you couldn't afford the apparatus to cook over a fire, you'd have dug a pit beside the fire and used stones from the fire, heated in the fire, um, to heat up that pit as a sort of oven. Or you'd have suspended a skin for a, like an animal hide full of water, put boiling, put hot stones in that to make the water boil and stewed uh, your meat, or what, if you could afford meat, but stewed whatever you're cooking within that hide. So the assumption that everybody has a kitchen isn't quite accurate. 
it, it does extend down society, through society to uh, the yeomanry and, and, and husbandmen, um, but uh, not to the bottom of society. By the 17th century, everybody had some form of kitchen or other. In fact, the kitchen could well be the main living space for a, a poor family. And you start to see um, the system whereby people have two kitchens. They might not have any other um, communal space, but they'll have two kitchens. The one kitchen ready for all the preparation, the wet work, and the other kitchen being like a, a, a semi-parlour um, a, 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 where you would talk to people and... Uh, um, and do the more refined elements of cooking and have roast meat roasting, for example. So you have this slow development of two kitchens, which becomes the norm in the 18th century and certainly was normal by 1800. Uh, yeah, and the, the, the kitchens probably all in themselves altered less than most things over this uh, long period of 1400 to 1700. But they would have, every kitchen would have, um, seen a, a greater proximity to the hall or the dining room where the food is going to be served and a greater number of utensils employed. Uh, one of uh, Somebody who lived in this house in the start of the last century, so in, uh, he bought it in 1908, was a man called Charles Laycock who decided to collect all the implements of everyday life that uh, illustrated how people lived before the railways came here. So he had a terminal date of 1860. And he went round all the, 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 the farms in 1909, 1910, buying up all the uh, um, metalwork they were no longer using. And quite often the things he was buying that they now moved on from, if they bought a cooker or something, quite often these went back to the 15th century. So the accumulation of stuff in people's kitchens and in the houses generally, but especially metalwork, ironwork that they used in their kitchens, these could last for centuries. So as the centuries went by, of course, they had much more of it. So, yeah, you, you have a great proliferation of stuff, I would say. That's a, in, put it in a nutshell. So before we, we move away from the kitchen aspect, I know we talked a little bit about the food and if you had enough money to have uh, the meat. Um, not everybody had a place to cook their own bread. Um, yep. So we kind of had an, have an idea about the food, but what about drinks? Because it's also interesting to think about um, the lack of obviously clean water to be drinking. What was what was everybody drinking? And I know we we actually had a few questions about wine or things well, that we we see as uh, adult beverages there's yeah, you know but children but in the home i mean if you can afford wine you're a gentleman or of that rank lady uh you are you've made it if you're having wine because most people cannot afford to drink wine uh and it remains that way all the way through until late in the 19th century when um wine started to sort of spread amongst the the, the, the lower middle classes but in the period we're talking about, wine and uh, going to a tavern where you drink wine in a town is exclusively for those who've got money. Anybody else would drink ale or, in the latter um, part of our period, beer. The difference between ale and beer is that beer has hops in it for flavouring, whereas ale, does, ale doesn't. Ale doesn't last very long uh, because the hops are not just a flavouring, they're also a preservative. So in the 15th century, first half of the 15th century especially, uh, most men would only drink ale. They couldn't afford wine. There are taboos against men drinking milk. Only women and children drink milk. And they they might drink cider, but it was much less common than people realised. More common was mead and methaglin, mead being honey fermented in water, and methaglin uh, uh, is the same sort of thing, but with herbs in it. So they might drink those. But otherwise, it's ale, ale, and ale, really. You haven't got much of a choice. And with ale, it lasts about three days. And what's Alexander Magno's uh, line on English ale? Um, it looks like pigs have wrestled in it, was his memorable line from 1563. Uh, mm. we start... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we uh, start to get beer uh, in the 1470s, 1480s. By 1550, beer has overtaken ale. And by 1600 beer is produced far in excess of um, ale with various standards of beer depending on how much malt you put in it so if a lot of malt 
makes your best beer, that's expensive, it's strong, it lasts. Uh, weak beer or mild, as you come down the, 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 the table of expense, as it were, um, it doesn't taste as good, it's not as strong, but you can drink it all day because there's a very low alcohol, alcohol content. Going back to water, though, because the idea that water pollutes people, that was definitely understood. But they have a grading of water. Water isn't just water in this period. Um, I put all this into the Time Traveller's Guide to Elizabethan England. They have different concepts of water. The most pure water is that which falls from heaven, lands on your roof, and you collect yourself in a system for the purpose. Now, that you can drink, and that they did drink. Uh, the greatest danger from that was really the, the lead cisterns in which they kept it. Um, next best was spring water, which, if you trusted it, you might drink, but normally you just used as your regular water supply. Well water is the third band of water, and that you do not drink. Well water is used for cooking and for cleaning, but you wouldn't actually imbibe it. And worst of all is river water, which is basically where you put your effluent. You don't use that. Having said that, brewers did take their water from rivers in order to have enough quantity, but of course they were boiling it in the course of making their ale and later beer. So people could drink water, but you had to acquire it in the right way. Now, I know that this might be uncomfortable for some people, but also we've had plenty of questions about our next topic, which we have to move on to. So bathrooms. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can just tell us whatever you want to tell us about bathrooms, so I don't have to get specific with the questions, but I'm sure you understand where people are coming from. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take that in the, 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 the word bathroom in English, uh, English obviously relates to where your bath is. Um, and I understand from American English, it also means toilets. So. Oh my goodness, yes. Okay, so toilets, baths, um, Washing, but also uh, human activities. You know what I mean. Um, okay, to start off with cleaning, as opposed to latrines, um, I was amazed when I was re researching Time Traveller's Guide to Medieval England way back oh, 25 years ago um, when I started that medieval kings had bathrooms. Um, Edward II had hot and cold running water. Uh, and Edward III did too. <clears throat> they... Um, they prided themselves on cleanliness at the top of society. So lords, um, aristocrats, diplomats, uh, royalty, they wanted to be clean. They wanted people to know they were clean. Um, so a, a lord arriving at the end of a, a journey would have his feet washed for him as a matter of course, if not having a, a full bath. Now, when syphilis came along and reached England in 1500, our attitudes to water changed radically. Uh, many people simply stopped having baths because baths were equated with sex um, because of the bordellos in London. But basically, people thought impurities, illnesses, were getting into their body through immersing their skin in water. And this put people off bathing. By the same token people realised they could do some good to themselves by bathing in the right stuff. So Queen Elizabeth I, for example, had a bathtub carried with her on her progresses around England and would use it in real contravention of the, 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 the time because she wanted, for therapeutic reasons, to, to have a bath regularly. She also bathed whether she needed it or not, according to one Italian ambassador. Uh, so... She would probably bathe on a regular basis, and that set her apart from the lower ranks of society. She also had a bathroom at a couple of her palaces. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head which ones, but she also had uh, 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 bathrooms in, uh, at home. Most people didn't. For most people, and this includes most aristocrats, a bathroom is a thing just completely off the radar until the 18th century. People would produce a bathtub and use it in the hall or their great chamber or, 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 or whatever. Um, now, when it comes to latrines, you have a great difference between town and country. In the country, especially if you've got a garden, you can just go and dig a new pit somewhere. Or you can collect your refuse and use it uh, as fertiliser. That isn't 
possible in the same way in town. So in the country, you would probably just have a hut in the garden with a board above it. Or as we see in some really well-preserved houses from the Weald of Kent, Wealden houses, so that's Kent and Sussex, you would have a, a, a chamber block. So normally adjacent to your, your, your householder's chamber, you'd go through a door into a little room where there'd be a, a seat with a hole in it and basically the barrel is placed directly beneath that and when the barrel is nearing being full then you'll go and distribute it on your gardens or you'll take it to the local lay stall to, to get rid of it there um, and that's you know, more or less the, the 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 run of it for um all the way through this period uh we don't have any um well, there, there are examples of people using watercourses in the 16th century but normally we only know about them from manorial records where people are complaining about it somebody's left too much excrement in a watercourse so uh, on the whole it's a case of use the space you have available in a town this is not possible because you do not have the space available uh, most towns um, were especially in the 16th century subject to enormous population growth and no extra land really for for accommodating these people I and mean, london is the classic example um, which between 1500 and 1600 expanded from about 50,000 people to 200,000 but it wasn't allowed to expand its boundaries queen elizabeth i said you are not building um, westward of drury lane and she basically said that's it so london had to just grow higher now, a lot of those people who were filling these towns, it's part of a general population expansion of about 30% over the course of the century. A lot of people came into London with nothing to sell but their labour. So they haven't got the wealth to buy new places. So they are renting um, houses in four or five storey buildings or converted old lords houses, which are no longer used by the lords uh, because the area has just become too overpopulated and contaminated and nasty uh, and in these cases their facilities are limited you did have chamber pots by the 16th century so you could use a chamber pot in your room and go and empty it but where are you going to empty it if you haven't got a, a cesspit um, the usual run of the thing was to have a cesspit in your basement and a number of cases are known from manorial records and from urban records where you only know your cesspit has overflowed when your neighbour complains about his basement being overrun with your excrement. Oh, so goodness. that is um, a common feature of urban living. The reason it got that bad is the cost of emptying these things. If you imagine a, a five-storey London townhouse tenanted by, say, uh, five families who keep things ev evenly uh, distributed and they're all emptying into the cesspit in the basement and that has to be emptied through the person who's got the dubious privilege of living on the ground floor well a he doesn't want it to happen because it's just going to make such a mess of his house secondly the cost i mean it can cost three pounds in the money of the time to to have a a, a, a basement emptied and if you're earning four pence a day even if there are five families living there you're struggling to feed your family. I mean, the, the struggle to find food is a real challenge throughout this whole period for the working class. You don't really want to spend three pounds on having a, a, a gongfama or two come in and clear out your basement. Uh, so it's it's a, it becomes a real problem how you get rid of excrement in, in, in towns and cities. In many cases, there are public latrines built on bridges because so many English towns are built on the river uh, or on a river. And normally they have a, a, a bridge near them. Frequently, you'll have public um, uh, latrines built onto the bridge. And of course, that's the cheapest way of getting rid of everything. Um, those that don't have a bridge, quite often there are places on the edge of the quay where people just chuck all the excrement and get rid of it that way. Uh, there are some cases in 15th century London of people having houses over streams and using the stream, having a sluice whereby they can actually flush away uh, everything that goes beneath their, uh, their latrine seat. Um, but they're very, very few and far between. 
Um, so John Harrington famously invents the the Ajax, the 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 loo that he presented to Queen Elizabeth I, which is a flushing water closet. Uh, but he only ever builds two, one for her and one for him. She was his godmother, by the way, uh, and no one else builds them at ten, until um, the 18th century. So you wouldn't get a flushing loo in anywhere. Um, and not even Elizabeth carried on using hers very often, but the the means of getting rid of everything is a real problem. So we have a greater refinement. I mean, chamber pots I mentioned, but also the, the close stool in which your chamber pot is put underneath a, a velvet covered stool, which you might use in privacy and have your servants take away to, to, to get rid of. Um, but for most people, it's use whatever space you can and the people who are really challenged by this are people living in houses, what we would call today houses of multiple occupancy, where they're all sharing one basement and they can't afford to have it emptied. So it sounds like, you know, again, the uh, lower class really had to put up with a lot, especially when yeah. it comes to this topic, yeah. um, because no privacy, no place to get rid of it. No. Um, um, it's also very interesting on that exact note how people associated smells with the lower classes. There's a, a London physician called Simon Foreman who was alive at the end of uh, Elizabeth's reign, and he specifically leaves um, one place of uh, where he consults with the public uh, because the smells from the latrine downstairs keep wafting up through to to his chamber, and he he doesn't want people coming to him for health advice to smell a latrine because that's how nasty diseases uh, spread in their uh, understanding of these things it's part of a uh, they didn't have any sense of germ theory they had no idea that germs were uh, an agency of disease they they associated things with miasmas so uh, a miasma of um, disease would grow up around things like a latrine and therefore if you could smell it you were affected by that miasma so he specifically moves his consultation room in order to avoid the smells coming from a, a latrine downstairs there's a real sensitivity to smell and class it's interesting that you actually brought up a physician because that's uh, my last question that I was going to bring up today was about um, health and kind of illnesses, doctors. So back in this time period in people's homes, did everyone have access to some sort of physician and where did they get their training if they didn't even, as you said, understand germ theory? What made someone a doctor? Steph, do you know what my PhD is in? Tell me. Uh, medical assistance to the dying in, in this period from 1570 through to 1720. Um, I could oh, so we could spend a lot of time on this. On this subject. Um, trying to keep it down to a, 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 a succinct answer. The key part of that question, well, if I can draw out the one key part of that question is, did everybody have access to a physician? Um, by 1700, the answer is yes. Uh, if I can say how we got to that position, it might explain why that answer is yes and what sort of yes that is. Uh, to begin with, in 1400, pretty much no is the answer. Um, there were surgeons. There were people who were recognised members of surgeons' companies. Uh, they were quite proficient surgeons because they had quite a lot of practice on the people getting killed in war and in industrial industry. In, uh, uh, accidents. So surgery was something you could trust their knowledge, but of course they normally infected you because there was no sense of germ theory, so therefore they uh, would carry diseases on their scalpels, etc. Um, and so you'd probably die from infection if you had uh, a surgery. Um, most people um, did not go to a physician. Physicians were few and far between. They were normally catering only to the wealthy, and a, a physician, for example, would want to know if you went to him in 1400, he would want to know um, when you started uh, feeling ill, so he would be able to cast the constellations and work out what the stars were doing at the time. He'd want to see your urine. He might want to taste your blood. Um, frequently, the, the answer to um, questions of what you need to do about uh, a particular disease was drawing blood. Their concept of medicine was still very Galenic, or in other words, based on the Roman um, teaching of uh, the, the, um, the, the medic Galen, um, so based around the humours of the body, the four humours of the body. 
Now, in the, about 14, 18, 14, 19, a number of physicians went to Henry V, the king, and asked him to make a, an official company of physicians so that they could basically have a set of qualifications. And the king said no. It didn't happen until 100 years later, uh, in 1519, when Henry VIII was asked the same question, and he said yes. And he set up uh, the College of Physicians, which later became the Royal College of Physicians. So they set a standard. Now, by the mid-16th century, in order to practice as a physician, not a surgeon, remember, this is a physician, you need um, either to have uh, a degree in medicine from Oxford or Cambridge, or one of the continental universities that specialised in medicine. You needed to have, alternatively, a licence from your bishop. You could have a licence directly from the Lord Chancellor, or you had to be a member of the College of Physicians. So those four forms of qualification meant there were some qualified, qualified physicians in the 16th century. Uh, but the majority of people who were actually catering to the man and woman in the street were not qualified physicians. They weren't necessarily quacks, but they weren't uh, uh, necessarily qualified. Um, I've done so loads and loads of statistics on this, and you're normally looking at about a third to a half of all the physicians practicing being unqualified in the 16th and 17th centuries. As the century, 17th century goes on, everything changes, and it changes because of the nature of medicines themselves, rather than the idea that everything is a, a humoral imbalance in the body. The idea starts that God provided somehow all the antidotes to all the diseases he also created. So it behoves mankind to find them, these antidotes, wherever they are in the world, and use them as medicines. So to put this in a nutshell, because people started creating medicines in vast quantities and importing them into this country in vast quantities and being much more experimental with what could be a medicine, if you were dying in 1600 and you wanted medical help, about 5% of the people actually paid for it and got it. In 1670, just 70 years later, if you were dying and you needed medical help, about 70% of the population paid for it and got it. As a medical revolution that takes place in the 17th century, and it's accompanied by the professionalization of the whole medical business. So that by 1670, you have your physicians, still members of the, uh, the Royal College of Physicians and licensed by bishops, etc. But they're providing a recognised service, they have standards, um, and they are supported by the apothecaries who are supplying the medicines, and they are sometimes working alongside surgeons. Um, surgeons basically work on the outside of the body and the physicians work on the inside. That's the rough uh, division. And by 1700, this has all become quite um, professionalised. Unfortunately, at that point, medicines have become such a, 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 a mainstay of this whole thing that people who can't afford to pay a physician just want to go and get the drugs. They just want the medicines. So they start paying the quack just to give them the cure-all. And that's where the whole thing starts to fall apart again. But yeah, we see huge changes and it's made possible to the, for the poor by the fact that paying for medical relief becomes part of the old poor law. If you reside in the parish, you will have the overseers, the poor of that parish, not only make sure you will not starve to death, but they also will give you medical help by paying for your medical assistance in the 17th century. So by 1700, the rich can afford the, the, the members of the College of Physicians and the, the middle classes can pay for the licensed physician who's licensed by the bishop and the poor are paid for by the overseers of the parish. So if you need medical help by 1700, unless you're a, a down and out or an outlaw or living off radar, as it were, completely outside the system, you will be able to get medical help. Now, did everyone go to a you know, if you had access to a licensed physician and all this, would everyone go for the same specialties? In other words, um, would someone go to somebody for issues with um, their eye uh, versus something with their leg versus um, a so, woman having a baby yeah. or all these different well, types midwifery of specialties? Midwifery is a different thing again. Um, midwifery obviously is dominated by women 
throughout the period, but you also have the rise of the man midwife and the, the surgeon midwife um, in, uh, uh, well, I suppose it's the 18th century mainly, but uh, from the time of the Chamberlain family, who are medical practitioners in the 17th century, they find out about forceps from an Arabic text that they translate, and they carefully and scrupulously guard the secret of forceps for about... I think it's about 80 years, only members of the Chamberlain family knew and could use forceps. So you might well go to the Chamberlain family if you're well off in London uh, and having a birth. Um, obviously, you would go for, for midwives. If, they, if that's what, I mean, having a child is not an illness, so it's, it requires a different set of skills. It might turn into an illness if everything goes wrong, in which case you might need a surgeon. But initially, the, the midwifery... Um, uh, cadre um, group um, are outside the rest of medicine. And the crossover is people like the Chamberlain family who are surgeons who have specific skills. Eye surgery doesn't really develop until the end of the 18th century, so uh, it, you wouldn't necessarily have specialists for that. Um, you do have specialist nurses dealing with smallpox patients and plague uh, victims, because if you've had plague, you're not going to get it again. So you would specialise in being a nurse looking after a plague victim because A, you got paid very, very well indeed, and B, you were safe. So nursing for um, the old women who and the middle-aged women who were looking after plague and smallpox victims, uh, they might specialise, but there's very little specialisation as such uh, in before 1700. Well, Ian, I have to say that I have enjoyed the last hour for so many that, reasons, actually. That's... Sorry? It's been an hour already. It's yes, it's been it's been amazing. And I could continue asking questions and just hearing everything you have to say forever and ever. Um, but I think that here is a good place to let you now take over with um, some of your books that we can find and some of your articles. I just want to make sure that everybody knows what to read to hear right. more of your knowledge and, and your research and everything that you've got to offer us. So what 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 can okay. we look up from you? Okay, I'm going to begin with a caveat because I, just, I mentioned my um, medical history background. Um, if you're interested in medical history, I suggest you do not look at my PhD thesis, which is published as the dying and the doctors. I'm very proud of it. It's won I me mean, lots of awards and things like that, but there are more numbers in it than there are words. You will find it <laughs> the densest, hardest, most unrewarding thing to read unless you want a lot of statistics on how far the poor would travel to get medical help and how far the rich would go and blah, blah, blah. It's got, if you're interested in statistics, it's got every damn statistic you'll want to do with medical history from 1600 through to, to the early 18th century. But it's not an easy read. I would avoid it. For understanding standards of living and basically everything about the English home and how people lived in this country from the 14th century through to the 19th, though you want to look at my series of books called The Time Traveller's Guide to uh, well, they told the first two are the Time Traveller's Guide to Eliz Medieval England and Elizabethan England. And then, of course, England became one political state with Scotland. So it then became uh, Time Traveller's Guide to Restoration Britain and Time Traveller's Guide to Regency Britain. Medieval period, I, I look at the 14th century uh, from beginning to end. The Elizabethan period is strictly Elizabeth's reign. The Restoration volume is the long restoration, so from 1660 through to 1700. And the last volume, the Regency one, is the long Regency from 1789 to 1830. Uh, not that that will interest you if you're, you're uh, interested in 1400 to 1700. Those are about social life. They ask the question, what would it be like if you really could go there? And they're divided into 12 or 13 chapters uh, uh, around these, these, these key themes of you know, medicine, what to eat, what you will drink, um, what medicines uh, might uh, help you and what diseases might kill you, what, what medicines might kill you for that matter, um, where to stay, standards of living, you name it, it's in those books. They aim to be comprehensive. They don't go into the details of sort of... Um, you know, marriage ceremonies and things like that, or education of... Uh, they, they try and tell you what it would be like for you as a modern person going and living there. What's going to strike you as being so different? 
because the whole idea is really to make you understand what it's like to be alive now by showing you what it's like to be alive then, giving you some point with which to contrast with your own time. Um, I th Those are going to cover the, how, how to live in England. Alongside those, I have written quite a lot about the royal English royal family between 1300 and 1415. There's a sequence of four biographies there. Um, Greatest Traitor, The Perfect King, The Fears of Henry IV, and 1415 itself, uh, which give you an overview of uh, the development of England in the late Middle Ages. There, the main idea is to show you how the biggest mover and shaker in each generation um, changed England and didn't just change the politics, changed the fabric of society, Edward III most of all. So there you have an arc of how one individual can really change um, the world around him. Uh, and in all these things, I have to say, they are basically research from primary sources. So archives and published primary sources, um, they are not about engaging with academic debates so much as showing you how the contemporary sources um, can reveal those people and those times. So I look at those two sets of four books, the Time Traveller's Guides, three of which are available in the States now, and the fourth one comes out later this year, and the the four biographies uh, for, for late medieval England. You really are such a wealth of knowledge, and I can assure you that regardless of the uh, topic, all of our listeners are definitely going to be interested in everything you have to say. And lastly, I, I just want to make sure that we uh, focus for one more minute on your upcoming book that you briefly mentioned earlier. Uh, which one? Uh, oh, I the, think you said Medieval Horizons. Medieval Horizons. Oh, yes. Uh, it won't come out. I haven't actually talked about it with an American publisher yet, but um, uh, it's coming out here in March or April of next year. It, that will be of interest to those who are interested in English home at an earlier date because it takes it, it, it starts off with the idea that most people think change is a matter of technology and a previous book of mine called centuries of change which looked at which century the last 10 saw the most change concluded that technology doesn't make things happen you have to have the desire for there to be change before the technology takes off and if you really look at what makes things happen. It, it's much easier to understand huge changes by using the metaphor of the horizon. Between the year 1000 and 15, 1600, you know, we went from people who didn't move really outside our, our, our place where we grew up and lived to circumnavigating the world. Our horizon of knowledge enveloped the world. Our horizon of trade enveloped the world. Our horizon of um, memory Obviously, we are producing billions of words by 1600, whereas the number of words written every year in this country in the year 1000 was probably fewer than a million. So in all these ways, the horizons and metaphor shows how society developed to the point where we can't actually imagine it being any other way. And I do this in general terms, and then I look in specific ways that this, this horizon metaphor can be used. So the horizon of war, the horizon of speed, belief it's, it's, it's an amazing thing but speeds trebled over the course of the middle ages with no change in technology um the the the, the changes as a result of uh, literacy and the, the translation of the bible that caused that uh, so it's really looking at the, the fundamentals of society through medieval change um, i'm really excited to see what people think of it i'm sure many people will hate it because it's 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 me just getting on my high horse and doing all the things i want to do but i hope therefore i'll have a few fans at the end of the day you sure will and we all respect your high horse so we're all going to read it right everybody <laughs> uh, thank, you. thank you of course of course so uh quickly again as always we have to give a, a thank you to all of our listeners who wrote in our questions t today thank you very much uh, yes absolutely we can't do our show without you so quickly thank you so much to sherry o'neill carrie ferguson heather e lee lisa taylor atia ash 95 S1 and CB, Denise Wards, Rebecca Larson, and Rachel Poole. So thank you to our listeners. And of course, thank you so much, Ian Mortimer. Everybody, please go out and buy and read everything. I mean, <laughs> just from this conversation, I think we know that he's our go-to, right? So thank you again, Ian. I hope you come back soon. 
Oh, I definitely will. Thank you very much, Steph. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 